one of the most important principles in meditating on the breath is learning how to experiment with it. Try different kinds of breathing to see which rhythm, which texture of breath feels best for the body right now, which is also best for the mind. Because some ways of breathing can put you to sleep, other ways of breathing can get you irritated. So you want to check and see what kind of breathing is going to make it easiest for the mind to settle down with a state of mindful alertness. And also want to stay there. If the body is uncomfortable by, because of the way you breathe, you're not taking advantage of the fact that the breath really can make it comfortable. I know a lot of people were surprised by this aspect of John Lee's instructions of breath meditation. They come to meditation with the idea that you're just supposed to let things happen on their own and not do anything on your own. Now you just watch the breath, however it comes in, however it goes out. But even the Buddha's instructions on breath meditation frequently contain the word, train yourself to do things in a certain way. Train yourself to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in, aware of the whole body as you breathe out. Train yourself so that the breath calms down. So it gives rise to the next step where you can train yourself to breathe in with a sense of ease, breathe in with a sense of rapture. And then you can even calm those feelings. There's an element of willing here, of fabrication. And that's important for not only getting the mind to settle down with a sense of ease, but also for developing insight. Because insight comes down to a matter of seeing cause and effect. I think it was Aristotle who defined intelligence as the ability to see connections. When you do X, Y happens. When you do Z, W happens. And the ability to see that on your own is a sign of intelligence. And intelligence can be developed by learning to look for causes and effects. And this is how you do it. You change the causes and see what impact that it has on the effects. This principle permeates all of the Buddhist teachings. Everything is checked by the results it gives. When the Buddha was teaching his aunt the basic principles of the Dharma, it came down to when you adopt a particular teaching, what effect that does it have? Does it give rise to passion? Okay, then that's a wrong teaching. Does it give rise to dispassion? Okay, that's the right teaching. In other words, you look at everything in terms of cause and effect. And you don't take anything for granted. Now, sometimes we hear that basic Buddhist insight is into the three characteristics. Impermanence, stress, not self, which doesn't seem to involve many connections. We have to remember two things. One, the Buddha never talked about three characteristics. The word three characteristics doesn't appear in his teachings. That was something added later in the commentaries. And he taught these three things, impermanence, stress, and not self, as perceptions, things you look for. But there's a larger context for looking for them or learning to see things in light of these. And the larger context comes in terms of the Four Noble Truths. The fact that there's suffering and that there's a cause for suffering. And there's also a path to the end of suffering. And there's the actual cessation of suffering. And this relates to a more basic issue, that the whole purpose of the Buddhist teachings is for the sake of finding true happiness. And he brings both the heart and the head together here. 
my heart's basic desire is for happiness with the least amount of effort. The head is the part that recognizes that there are causes and effects and there are patterns that you have to learn. And you want to get these two sides of the mind to work together. In other words, you want the heart to respect the fact okay, that if you want true happiness, it's going to require some work. You have to get the causes right. At the same time, the head has to recognize that true happiness is a worthwhile goal. You don't just think about things and analyze them just for the sake of analyzing and showing that you're smart. You want to work at things in such a way that you can find true happiness, understand cause and effect, so you can find true happiness. And as the Buddha traces out the causes of suffering, one of the big causes is clinging. And so one way of working through clinging and letting, learning how to let go is to see things in terms of those three perceptions. But the basic insight goes deeper. You apply those perceptions when they actually serve the purpose of leading to a, a greater happiness. So all the teachings have their time and place. You have to see them in the larger structure of this pursuit of happiness, and trying to do it and trying to do it in an intelligent way. And a large part of this means that you have to be heedful. You can't just assume that anything that comes popping up in your mind or any idea that you have is going to lead to true happiness. You can't assume that any teaching you receive from anybody is going to lead to true happiness. You have to test things. And so basically what the Buddha does is he points out, okay, this is a good way to test things. Learn to get the mind to be still. Get it into strong states of concentration where everything is very, very still. So you can get better at watching. When a thought comes into the mind, when an idea comes into the mind, what does it do to the mind? If things aren't really still, you can't see the, the impact of a thought and the impact of, a, of an action very clearly. It's like trying to listen to a very soft piece of music on the stereo at the same time that you've got a lawnmower going outside, or trucks driving up and down the road. The background noise is so loud that it obscures the subtleties you're listening for. The same way with the mind. Unless you can get the mind really, really still, you can't really watch the effects of your actions, the effects of your words, the effects of your thoughts. Because what may seem perfectly harmless in an ordinary state of mind, when your mind gets really, really still, you begin to see it really does have an adverse impact on the mind. So this is why we work at bringing the mind to concentration. This is why the Buddha said concentration should be developed. It doesn't say states of concentration come and go, you just watch their coming and going and see, oh yes, this is impermanent, stressful, not self. That's not, one of the, that's not the duty that the Four Noble Truths assign to concentration. The duty is when you have states of mindfulness, you try to develop them. In states of concentration, you try to develop them, make them stronger, because you're going to need them as tools. So whatever serves as a tool on the path, you've got to take care of it. You don't just let it go. And the same with the breath. You work with it. You take care of it, because it's going to help you get the mind to settle down. It's going to help give you a good, solid foundation here. You know, someone who was studying in Thailand one time, and she'd been doing the John Lee method, and she and a teacher said, what is this, improving the breath? You're, not, you're just supposed to let it go and be on its own. After all, it's just a sankara, it's just a fabrication. Why try to improve it? And she came to me and reported what he had to say. And my response was, well, go back and ask him. Well, same with your body. Why bathe it? After all, it's just a sankara. Just going to let it go. And of course you can't do that. You've got to look after the body because you're using it as a tool. It's the same way with the breath. You look after the breath, tend to it, because it helps the mind to settle down with a sense of ease and solidity that you're going to need for deeper insights.
and at the same time working with the breath, you get insight into cause and effect. Because even when the mind settles down and you see things, you've got to test them. Sometimes you hear the teaching that once the mind settles down, you get in touch with the Buddha. Excuse me, you get in touch with the Buddha nature, and you can trust whatever your Buddha nature tells you. The Buddha never taught that. Even for stream matters, he said you've got to be heedful. You can't trust everything that comes out of the mind. Even with arahants, he told them they had to be heedful about their actions. Even fully enlightened beings can't totally assume that everything that they see or hear is actually the way it is. They have to test it. You look in the Vinaya, there are actually a couple of rules that were formulated because some arahants made some mistakes. There's the rule against monks eating stored up food. Balatasisa, who was an arahant, figured, well, I can just go for alms once a week take the leftover rice and dry it, and that's a nice frugal way of living, and I don't have to go out for alms every day. Just eat the leftover rice from the day before. The Buddha found out about it and found out about it and took him to task. He said, this is not a wise course of action. Now the story doesn't explain what the Buddha's reasoning was, but you look at the history of Buddhism and you see down the line that when monks stopped going for alms, They created a rift in the community. The monks lived on their own. They had their own kitchens. Lay people basically stopped caring about the monks. And as a result, when the Muslims came in and destroyed the mon monasteries, the lay people didn't really care. The connection had been severed. And the Buddha saw that far ahead. So even fully awakened arahants can't always assume that what they think is true. They've got to test it and check it, just like everybody else. So when insights arise in your meditation or when you gain an intuitive feel for something, the question is not where the insight comes from, but what happens when you apply it. In other words, you use it as an experiment. You're developing an experimental intelligence here. You take the passages you read in the text, you experiment with them. You take the insights you receive from meditation, and you experiment with them. There's a list in one of the suttas, and I think it's the very first sutta in the Dikhanagaya, of all the different kinds of wrong views that people can develop. And it's not the case that every wrong view comes from people simply thinking things out without having practiced meditation. There are a lot of wrong views that come from people who meditate and gain some insights or gain some intuitive knowledge. But the knowledge isn't as complete as they thought it was. So they come to some wrong conclusions. So what this means is, whether the source of your insight is something you've learned from a text, something you've thought out on your own, or an intuitive feeling you have, or something that comes up in your meditation, you always have to test it to see, if I adopt this, where does it go? What does it connect with? What are the connections here in terms of cause and effect? And that's how you test what, in terms of the insights you gain, are which ones are fool's gold and which ones are genuine gold. You put them to use and then see what happens. And you always take that heedful attitude that says, okay, I'm, I'm testing things here. Just because the truth is something that you like. Again, the Buddha said, just because you like a particular truth or it seems to fit in with your worldview, that's no guarantee that it's actually true. We've all read the Kalama Sutta where the Buddha says you don't take religious texts as being necessarily true. That's the part everybody seems to remember. The other part, though, is, is that 
He also says, so don't take what you like as necessarily being true. Don't take what seems to fit into your worldview as true. Don't take what seems to work out logically as necessarily being true. You've got to test things. When you adopt these ideas, what happens? You check them not only against your own experience, but also the experience of wise people. In this way, you're much more likely to find truths that really, really are true. Because they've stood up to the test. Of course, this means you too have to be very careful in how you conduct your tests. Which again is why we try to work at developing concentration, developing mindfulness, all the mental attributes of alertness, mindfulness, discernment, concentration, to put us in a position where we really can test things and evaluate the results. So that we're not overcome by bias. And that we can become able to overcome the limitations of the worldviews and ideas that we bring to the practice. After all, the purpose of the practice is to see things we never saw before, to attain things we never attained before. That means you have to learn how to overcome the limitations of your assumptions. And this is how you do it. You open yourself up to this experimental way of developing intelligence. So that your heart's desire, which is a true happiness, will get fulfilled. Not quite the way you might have wanted it. After all, it does require work, but it's, it's a path of work and of effort that leads ultimately to a happiness that once you've attained it doesn't require any effort to maintain it. It's only through gaining intelligence in terms of cause and effect that you can find this happiness that ultimately lies beyond cause and effect. So we work with the nitty-gritty of just learning to observe what's going on in the mind, testing it. Learning to put away whatever assumptions don't pass the test. Because it's only through working in the details like this that you ultimately will break through to something that's much larger and more lasting.